Planet on Planet 412. My name is Matt Amsh and I'm your host. I'm going to be your captain of sorts, trying to go through this absolutely insane, supernatural and encrypted world that we live on, one of many. I've had a long life of strange things happen to me. Um, I feel I am lucky in some aspects. I feel unlucky in some of them. And it all started when I was just a baby. Um, my mother got a call from my grandma when I was really young and I was in the crib and my grandmother wanted her to come over and have lunch with her. And, and my mother couldn't because even now to this day, I just don't sleep. And, my legs always shaking and, and I'm always active and, and I only get a few hours of sleep a night. And apparently I wasn't sleeping at all as a baby, which isn't a surprise. And my mother told me that she told her mother, my grandmother, that she couldn't come to lunch to see her that day because she was so exhausted that Matthew wasn't sleeping and she didn't know why he wouldn't sleep. And even when he's asleep, his legs shaking in bed. And, I'm giving a quick rendition of this, and, and my grandmother made a prophecy about me. She told my mother the day she died that that Matthew, and my mother told me she chuckled, and she said, he's going to bless your life someday. There's something special about him. And an hour later, my grandmother was gone, and I never got to meet her. I really wish I could have. I've had things going on in my life ever since I can remember. I've always noticed details that most people don't. Even to this day, my family, quite honestly, gets freaked out by things that I notice, details I notice. Um, and they always ask, how do you see those things? How, how did you notice that? And I really can't explain it. It's just something I've always been able to do. That pretty much brings the first real major encounter, if you want to call it, uh, when I was 14 years old. I grew up in Youngstown, Ohio. And when I was 14, I had just gotten out of grade school, getting ready to go into high school, and it was summer. It was June, very warm, and me and three of my friends, my best friends, uh, we had a bigger group, I just want to say that, but just on this day, there were four of us, and we would ride our bikes or walk or however. And we would go everywhere. We would go to different parts of the city. Um, we would go to the suburbs around and we would go far. And one of the places that we liked to go um, was the old steel mills in Youngstown, Ohio. And, uh, you know, I, I always say this, you can Google uh, old steel mills, Youngstown, Ohio, specifically the blast furnace in Youngstown, Ohio. And that will show you a picture of exactly where I'm talking about. And we used to frequent this building, this one building, and we made it our home base, so to speak. And the night that we were there, um, it was probably, I would say, 9.30, 10 o'clock, somewhere in between there. And it was a big concrete four floor building. Uh, in the middle of it, you could walk into the center of the first floor and you could look up and uh, you could see all the way up to the fourth floor. And in the center, starting of the first floor, second floor, third floor and fourth, um, you had a concrete on the first, but second up to the fourth, you could look from the middle of the room all the way up to the ceiling because in the center, of each floor starting from the second to the fourth there was no floor there was a half wall and there was a square cut out of the middle of that floor and you could walk up to this half wall and you could look down well we used to build fires in the middle of that floor because it was concreted as i said and we didn't have to worry about anything catching fire because it was just concrete and old rebar and being an old dilapidated rusting away steel mill facility area that went for miles. Um, there really wasn't anybody down there except packs of wild dogs, which if you live in cities that, that might have areas that aren't frequented by humans very often, um, you will get packs of, of 
a lot of mostly mutts, mixed animals, or just dogs that have ran away from home and they depend on each other and they would run around in packs of six to 10 and they were not very friendly and they're not the type of dogs you would want to call to you or get attention. Aside from that, Youngstown, Ohio, when I grew up, this was probably around 1987. It wasn't the most safe of towns at that time, unfortunately. Uh, through the years, Youngstown has got some monikers that, you know, being people that have grown up in the city and proud of our city of Youngstown, Ohio. Um, we've had monikers that didn't make us really proud, and at times it would be called Murder Town USA. And the reason I say that is because per capita, uh, Youngstown at different times, um, just had a, a lot of murders and there was a lot of gang violence at that time uh, the late 80s through the early 90s uh, there was there was you know bloods and crips and yes it, it even made its way to Youngstown and there were other gangs and another thing that that was part of Youngstown Ohio even to this day they're they're really not known that they're there but they're still there is is the mob and mafiosa and people think that you know those things disappeared a long time ago, but they just got quiet and, and you didn't hear much about them. And, and we knew they were still around in the, in the early 80s and late 80s uh, and even into the 90s. And people would go down to this area and they would sometimes do nefarious things, things like maybe hide bodies when they got rid of people or take some people out possibly and we'd hear gunshots a lot down there and you'd see weird cars down there in areas that there really shouldn't be or um you know, there'd be homeless people down there that might be dangerous or they wouldn't bother you uh the thing that we were most worried about was the packs of the wild dogs because they were known to kill and they would gang up on on a single animal or human being and during this time uh, there was supposed to have been at least two unfortunate uh, homeless people that were supposedly killed and mauled to death by uh, these packs of wild dogs. And um, what we would do is we would just arm ourselves. Yes, at 14, we would do that. And, and we would just have some, you know, a, a, a few weapons on us and we would never shoot them or shoot at anything. We just had them to protect ourselves just in case. Um, this night in question, um, we were down there, I, I can't think of the exact date, but it was very warm, it was completely dark. The sun had gone down, obviously, between 9, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and there was no shortage of anything to burn down there. Um, we would use pallets or anything and, and, and just make giant fires. And, you know, real quick, I just wanna say, we would be in this building, we first found it, we liked it because there wasn't a staircase. Uh, there was this concrete kind of, I don't know, you know patio, broken up patio outcropping of, of concrete that a, a set of stairs used to be, but it had broken away and, and just crumbled away over the years of just misuse or non-use. And uh, it was very dilapidated and you'd have pieces of concrete fall once in a while from the ceiling. and. On the stairs, you'd have missing stairs with, again, just pieces of rebar sticking out here and there. And it was a dangerous place and we really shouldn't have been down there. And um, We were just kind of staring at a fire that we had made, a really large one that night. And everyone, you know, you've been there. You've been to campsites and in your backyard or even just burning leaves or something. And fires draw you in you know you kind of just stare at them and you watch the the flames whip and and people kind of zone out and that's what we were doing we were just all at one point just kind of staring at this fire zoned out and you could hear the fire crackling and, and burning and nobody was making a sound and all of a sudden we heard barking and uh we figured and knew it was a pack of these wild dogs. So we made our way out to this concrete outcropping and we knew they couldn't run up there and get us. It was too high because you'd have to jump up and kind of almost roll up to get into this building. And another thing we had done before I move on from that is 
there were open walls on all four sides. The, you know, the north, south, east, and west sides were open on the fourth floor. And there were uh, these metal shaped whatevers. Um, the best way I can describe it is if you Google uh, old gladiator shields, and they used to have shields that if you were holding it, it would be bent towards you. So it, it would most likely protect the shoulders if a spear or sword came in. And um, that's how these were shaped. And there was hundreds of them. And what we did is we took them and they were heavy. It would take two of us to move one. And we lined them up along these walls and, and to one end and the other. And then we were able, as we were pretty big kids for 14, uh, we picked up you know, some of these and we were able to make a second row, kind of staggered them so that the bottom of it, when it turned, it would lay on top of two of them. So we had two rows and that was as high as we could put them. And it was taller than all of us. And we were satisfied that not only did that kind of make us safer, it kept prying eyes out. And that's what we wanted more than anything. We weren't worried the dogs could get in there. We were more worried about somebody down there that shouldn't be doing something, like I said, nefarious or more worrisome was somebody from the railroad seeing us and calling the police. Now, there is a, a working railroad and working steel mill there now. It's not on the site of this old uh, steel mill, but it's just to, I, I believe it would be to the west or if you're facing another way, the other way, uh, to the east. And that works now. Um, but then it was just this old steel mill, if I believe, I could be wrong. And as I said, we heard dogs barking and we went outside and you know, all we had was the light of the fire that was peeking out at the above point of where this makeshift wall that we had made, you know, there was probably another six to eight feet in between the top of the second row and the top of the building. So there was an opening at the top that was letting out light. And on top of that, it was a summer night and, and the moon was out and it was somewhat bright you could still see outside our eyes were somewhat adjusted obviously we came from inside the fire was burning so it wasn't great and we went out and i remember seeing i probably six to seven dogs run by us and normally they would always pay attention to us but they didn't pay attention to us this day and ironically right when they got to about where we were standing they made a quick left and right outside in front of the building was a railroad track that went right by the building and and i just assume it was so close to this blast furnace and these other buildings so that when the steel making process was going on they would be able to ferry steel out bring in new you know ingredients for such and and it just made it easier so what happened was these dogs ran over the railroad tracks and what came next was a huge pile of what's called coke in, in the steel making industry and i'm not talking coca-cola or the other coke um it's just a, a material i don't know really what it's made of um they just use it to to make steel i think it helps burn it hotter and to purify it and there was tons of it and it went for miles to each end and it was probably 15 to 20 feet high and these dogs ran up one side and then they ran down the other and immediately within a couple seconds we started hearing them attack we thought they were fighting with each other and within a few seconds after that, we figured out that they were not. There on top of the sound of what you know when dogs attack, especially a group, what that sounds like, we start to hear something louder, deeper. And we started to figure out real quick, even though we couldn't see what was going on, um, there was something being attacked by these dogs on the other side, but quickly, what started to happen is we started to hear dogs yelp and it started to become very apparent that they were not winning this attack they were doing and what happened next was when the craziness started so to speak and a couple dogs came flying over the top of this pile of material 
one was turned upside down with its butt facing us and its tail in the air. And it had been literally thrown almost like someone was on the other side of that and they grabbed one of the dogs and they threw it. And another one came over and it hit the top of this pile of material and it went everywhere. And when this dog hit the ground, the first one had already started to run away. The second one, unfortunately, had its left side from the shoulder down to the rib cage flayed open like someone had taken a knife or something and cut it open and there was blood everywhere and it was limping and crying and ran away. And I remember, cause I am just a huge animal person. I love dogs specifically. I've had dogs my whole life. We still have one. and. Um, I remember thinking as it ran away, I hope that dog lives and, and I'm not so sure if it did. And then a couple more dogs came flying over and, and they hit the ground and got up and limped away. And then a couple more ran over the hill and they took off. They were gone. They did not want anything to do with what was over there. And we were completely shocked. So we're watching them run away, which would be to our left. and. One of my friends who was to my left and behind me taps uh, me in the back, small of the back, and he goes, guys, what is that over there? And we look and what crawls up to the top of this mound was quite honestly the biggest creature we had ever seen. I've never seen anything to this day like it. And it was so large that I thought it looked fake. And I have said this many times, I've been in a number of interviews through the last couple of years. And I will never change what I say because there's only one way to describe what I saw. I wolf-like creature so big that we felt like we were asleep. I was waiting for any moment to wake up um, and I didn't and none of my friends did either. And it was watching these dogs run away as if to say, I let you go, don't come back to my territory, and um, it lifted its leg and we immediately, you know, figured out that this was a male and it started to do its business. And some of you might find that funny or amusing, but we didn't. And the reason we didn't was because the force of the stream came out so hard and it was so noticeably powerful that we were taken aback, I especially me. And I immediately got the fear of God in me because if something was doing something as simple as, as relieving itself, but not only was it relieving itself, I really got the impression that what it was doing was it was marking its territory and it was looking in the direction of those dogs. And it was almost like I got the sense that I knew what it was thinking. It was thinking, don't come back. You won't leave again. This is my place. And we started to get deathly afraid. And my friend that was behind me had started to back up and unfortunately um, fell into our makeshift wall that was very heavy metal and it was on concrete. And I know all of you know the sound of metal scraping on concrete. And excuse the poor imitation, but it was the kind of scratching, loud, jarring noise. And we all kind of looked at him and I immediately got the, the, the anxiety, the fear in my chest. And we all looked at this thing and it snapped its head and it turned to the left and it looked at us. And immediately what we saw told us that this wasn't normal, this wasn't right. The eyes, it's, it's eyes, they, they, they were glowing, but not only glowing like eye shine, they were like burning from the inside, like there was an energy coming from this thing. And immediately you got the sense of something is really wrong here. What, what is going on? And it looked at us and you could see, see the pupils and, and, and every aspect of that anatomy of that creature's just eyeballs were so large again, taken aback and in the mindset of, oh my God, what are we looking at? This can't be real. I'm going to wake up any second, right? And happen. 
and you could see where it was looking you could see the eyes moving and you could see which one of it was you know we were looking at or it was looking at and i felt it look at me and when it did you know look at me and it looked me in the eyes and it looked me up and down and i felt as if my soul had been bored through every part of my body was screaming something's wrong you need to get out of there but we were frozen and then what happened was when all of our lives changed forever and I look at my shirt right now and it's similar to what we saw and this thing did what you see on my shirt and it stood up on two legs and immediately what we had been taught from the time we were young, horror movies, the magazine Fangoria, mythology, hearing about werewolves and nothing like that is real and it's all made up and movies are fake, all came crashing down, literally. And being 14 year old boys, being babies compared to adults like a lot of us are these days we can look back and say 14 oh my god you know we're just children and we were and we had something that isn't supposed to exist standing there in front of us and it growled at us and when it did it wasn't just a grr it was so loud and so jarring that we felt it. And I liken it to a combination of a tiger, a wolf, and an alligator. And if you look online and you look up infrasound, animals on the planet Earth utilize this. And what it is, is it's a frequency that they can drop and utilize air sacs in their throats and other things inside of them that will literally shake and jiggle and jar the insides of prey and it will confuse and, and discombobulate prey so that the tiger or a lion elephants can even do it uh, whales do it to, to get their their songs heard from many miles away and you also see if you watch an alligator in the water when it does its, its, if you want to call it a growl or whatever, you see its back shake and water ripples and jumps off its back. And I liken this noise to that. It was nothing I'd ever heard before. None of us had. And we all immediately got sick. And I felt like you feel in a dream when something's chasing you and you feel like you're running through tar your legs don't feel like they want to work from the thighs down to my ankles i felt like i was going to drop to my knees and my my best friend to my right later had said he felt similar my other two friends were bent over one was dry heaving the other said he thought he was going to pass out and then this thing that was shaped somewhat like a man with the most over exaggerated long arms that look like it could scratch its toes while standing up straight took two steps off the top of this pile of material and it was literally so close to us with two steps it had been probably 20 to 25 feet from us and within two steps it was at least half that distance and even though we were affected by whatever this thing threw at us in the form of a, some type of growl, we made our way uh, back in the building and we ran in slowly, um, clumsily, falling all over each other and, and barely able to run. And for whatever reason, we made it up to the third floor and we had to jump over stairs that weren't there and rebar, you know, catching your pants that were, was where concrete used to be. And for whatever reason, we went up to the third floor and there really was no escape from up there because 
the stairs would take us right back down. Going up, there were two ways. There was outside, there was a fire escape. And that's a belying word, escape, because there was no escape on this, this stairway. The stairway from the second floor to the first had also been dilapidated since it was so unused over the years and being made of metal. It had rusted away and fell to the ground in a heap at the bottom. And you could go from the second floor outside up to the roof or you could go up to the fourth floor where there was a very short staircase that would take you up to the roof, but there was no way down. And my one friend who had noticed it first and ran in the building first was very scared and screaming, we have to get out of here. And we were all afraid, especially me, because I knew the more noise you make in a situation like that, it had not come in. But if you keep making a noise, it's gonna come in. And I remember I grabbed him and I grabbed him around the mouth. And I was a bigger guy back then even too. And I grabbed him so hard, I didn't realize I'd lifted him up off the floor and his feet were dangling and he started to, you know, need air and he was still screaming with my hand cupped over his mouth and the others are yelling at him to stop as quietly as they can. And finally I let him down and with my hand still on his mouth, we're saying, you've got to be quiet. It's going to come in here. And finally he was losing so much air. He just shook his head. Yes. And I slowly took it off. and. Just as that happened, the building thumped and we literally felt vibration in our feet. And I knew what would happen. And what happened was this thing made its way into the building and we had this fire going and it came in. Still that thought of the size of this thing was so big it can't be real. I, I'm still thinking I'm, I'm gonna wake up any minute, right? This can't be real. We've all been taught this just isn't real, right? No. It came in and it, it walked by the fire and some strange things happened and definitely got the idea that this was not a normal creature made by the God that we were taught, you know, presided over planet Earth. And these eyes were shining. You could see them light the wall up and it was looking for us. It was salivating, which gave me the impression that it was ready to eat or kill. It was sniffing the air and finally it caught our scent. And it looked up at us on the third floor and we were standing in front of this half concrete wall, frozen as 14 year olds would be seeing something like this, completely confused as to what's going on and have no idea. I don't think trained soldiers would have known what to do. And it growled again at us and we felt vibration through the building and I had my right or left hand, I don't remember which, it was on top of the wall and even the wall vibrated in front of me and we didn't get sick like we did before. I believe what had happened was this concrete wall had blocked whatever it threw at us the first time, thankfully. But what it did next, um, again, it just reinforced this situation of supernatural and wrong. And it stood up again and it threw its arms out to its side, almost like this shirt, very similar. And it just bared its teeth almost, almost like a sick smile with its, with its eyes angered. And it looked at the stairs and it looked at us. And then it looked back at the stairs and dropped down to four. And it ran for those stairs and immediately I got the sinking feeling as a 14 year old and no child should ever think of this, that my life was about to end because I knew there was no way out of here. My friends, two of them started running. One ran for the fire escape. The other ran for that short 
uh, set of stairs on the fourth floor. So he ran up the third floor stairs to the fourth and I lost sight of him. My other friend ran outside and you could hear his feet running up the metal staircase and thinking back now, thank God he didn't fall through that and it didn't break away then. Me and my best friend were stuck in place as if we had been made into human-like mannequins that had no ability to run away. And I stared at this thing running up the stairs like it was made of liquid metal or oil, almost a beauty to it, looking like almost a panther using its tail as a rudder as it turned up the different parts of the stairs so that it would stay even. It was using its tail for, for counterbalance. And its hair was short, it was almost groomed, and its tail was not bushy, it was like a cougar or panther's tail. Very long. Again, the front arms, so unrealistic. Again, looking fake. Almost as it's running, it's at an angle a little bit. You know, the front lift up higher because these front arms were so abnormally, nightmarishly long that it was at an angle and its back legs were not as long as its arms. And it made its way up to the second floor in a blink of an eye. And I need to explain something real quick of where I was standing. I was standing near the stairs. So whoever, or in this case, whatever, was coming up those stairs was myth and legend and flesh and blood and whatever else and the first person that it would have met would have been me and at that moment i got to experience what you hear so many people in movies or in real life discuss when their life flashes before their eyes and i didn't see my future I saw my family. I came from a family with five children in it, and we still are all around. My mother and father, who I loved very much, who are no longer with us, and my dog. And I thought about other things, like going to school and playing football and having a life. And I really believed that my life was about to end and I was going to die a horrible death. And our friends were only going to watch each of us be mauled and whoever died first and last would witness everything. And we could scream and beg for God and help and it wouldn't come because no one would hear us. And it made its way maybe about six, seven feet from me and I truly had the sense of what I can only imagine People in, in, in war or that are gonna be murdered by someone feel, and I'm not trying to cheapen that in any way, shape or form. I don't claim to be a, a, a soldier or anything, and I'm not. I honor our military, but I'm just saying that must be how people have felt that you believe, truly believe you're gonna die and I was petrified and I didn't know what to do. And it was so close to me that if it would have jumped, it would have been on top of me. And what happened next, I will always believe until my time comes that someone above, whoever that may be, a higher power decided to intervene and a train came by this building and did something that never happened. It yanked on the, the chain, obviously, that causes the, the horn to sound. And when it did, of course, it was extremely jarring to everyone, including this creature. And it stopped six feet, seven feet from me. And it looked back at the opening of the building and it looked back at me. And it did almost a double take, it, it, with the look of almost, mm, damn it, I, I want him, 
but someone is there now. And it did a double and it looked at me almost disappointed and angry and it left the building. And it left the building so fast, it was impossibly fast. And it was running physically like a creature until it hit the last set of stairs where it turned into all I can explain as a shadow person or being. And it lost all form of what it was and just left in the blink of an eye. And we had talked about it many times over the years and um, we all agreed we saw the same thing and we saw a lot more detail. And we started screaming for help, someone save us, and it never came. The train kept going down and farther away and getting quieter and quieter. And my friends came down because they heard us screaming and they thought we were saved, which we weren't. And they started screaming as well, almost one of them with a half smile on his face, almost that relief of, we're gonna be okay or are we gonna be okay? And it was gone and the fear crept back in that this would be coming in any minute. And then, thank God it didn't. And we had to all but pull my friend uh, from the building to, to leave, which took a little over an hour. And took a half an hour to get back to my friend's house who lived across the street from the steel mill on the highway. And it was as nightmarish not seeing it again as it was seeing it because every sound we heard running back signaled this creature to us in our minds. And we finally made it back. And we just sat there and we stared across the way at the direction of where this building would be because we were a half an hour away now. And we were in shock. And we all had decided we would tell each other's parents together, which we did, and the majority of them did not believe it, including mine at first, just my dad. And my best friend's dad, uh, however, gave us the sense he knew what it was. And he had a position in the city and called my father and told him what happened in the kitchen away from us and made him promise that he would tell me not to talk about it, that it would destroy our lives, all of our lives, and we would be the laughing stocks of Youngstown. And we would all never live it down and not be able to live our lives normally. And they put the fear of God in us that we wouldn't talk about it. And we kept our mouths shut for years. And two of my friends, my best friend and my other good friend are no longer with us. God rest their souls. And I wish they were here and they're not. My other friend's still here and he has major mental issues and I've had problems over the years. I've had to seek counsel from a priest and from a psychiatrist over the years and I have PTSD to this day. Not just from that, but because last April, um, I went through some serious health issues. Uh, I almost passed away three times. One time my heart stopped for 90 seconds because I had my left, no, I apologize, my right leg amputated. And I had fallen where I would assume most of us would when you are used to two legs and you have one, you don't know how to handle that. And I fallen and I caused my sutures to come out and long story, very short, the artery blew in my leg and I bled out almost completely in front of my wife and daughter and lost consciousness and my heart stopped as I said and I no longer fear death, fear death because I got to see my parents who were both gone and some of you are going to probably scoff at that and not believe it and that's fine because I understand that that this experience that I'm having, and I need to, to tell you all, I will always refer 
to what happened to me as an experience and not a story because there's a difference between the two in my opinion. A story is just that. It's a story, it's made up or possibly not, but I see it that way. Mine was an experience, it really happened. It happened to four of us and we all saw the same thing. And when my heart stopped and I saw my parents my mother told me it wasn't my time and she put her hand on my face as she did when I was younger. And when she did that, I woke up on the operating table right before they gave me anesthesia to save my life. And they did. But I know that there's something else out there. And you can believe if you like, or you cannot. And I, again, don't begrudge any of you for not believing because there's a lot of those on this planet that have nothing happen to them in their lives and they have, for the most part, non-eventful, normal, but boring lives. And they don't have anything happen that opens their mind to the ability of knowing that there's more out there than just what we're taught. And if nothing like exceptional, supernatural, or something happens to you, then again, I don't blame you. I don't hate you for not believing me. But I don't care if you do or you don't. And in the end, I, I also want to say, as we take this journey together on Planet 412, you're gonna hear other experiences and, and stories and you're going to have to decide for yourself if you're going to believe it. It's not up to me to tell you if it's 100% true. I can only tell you what I know. I know what happened to me and my friends, and it was true. And those of you out there, and I'm looking at you right now, those of you that know me, that really know me, you know I'm telling the truth. You know that I'm not the type that would lie about something like this. I just wouldn't. My father, who was one of the greatest human beings that ever lived, was an overgrown Boy Scout, kind of like Captain America. He could have easily fit into the suit. He was a big six foot four man, handsome, and the greatest human being you have ever met. And he was the most honorable soul that has ever lived and taught us five children that one of the most important things that you can do in life is be honest and tell the truth and be loyal to your friends and family. And nothing is more important than friends and family, especially in my family. If you can just imagine how the unknown universe, and I say unknown because you think about, you hear scientists and people from NASA talk about the known universe. And I always kind of chuckle when I hear that because even beings that most likely have been here for millennia upon millennia, longer than we have, don't really know how big this universe is. You know, when I think about that, I think about a being that is the creator. And we have all of these planets that are supposed to be in unknown numbers of galaxies out there in those Goldilocks zones, so to speak. and. You think about how many different kinds of beings and species that could be running around out there so much more advanced than obviously they are. We've been seeing a lot more with social media and TV and technology that we have in 2023. The government has been releasing more and more things showing these unknown ships and UFOs or UAPs that they call them, unmanned aerial phenomena. And I always think about on every other planet that could be out there, because it, let's be honest with each other, it's mathematically impossible for us to be alone. And I really do think it's very small minded to believe that we here on planet Earth, in just the beginning, the infancy of this planet, are the only beings that are intelligent enough to have this kind of idea of how things work. I think of a being out there that has created everything since the beginning of time. 
I'm a believer that everything that goes on is written in stone before anything was created. And I think of that being out there constantly stretching and pulling the universe and, and they say that it's getting bigger every day. I find it amusing that, that there's those on this planet that think that they are aware of how big it is and I, I don't think there really is an end or a beginning to it. I think it's infinitely large. And then when you take into account how really unbelievably big it can be, you can't even wrap your mind around it. You think about how many planets, how many trillions upon quintillions of planets there are out there. And then that tells you mathematically it is absolutely impossible for us to be the only intelligent beings in this unknown universe. And it excites me, it makes me really you know, pretty thrilled to think about what can be out there. And you think about on each of those planets that they're intelligent beings and you know that they also believe in a higher power. And what do they think of? And, and what do they think that higher power is? And I don't think there really is one specific one. I think it's every being that is alive in this universe has their own idea of what it is and and you know here on earth it's very specific and there are factions about how we think god is and who god is and what god is and what sex god is and i don't really think there really is a specific type of being that we can point to my point i'm getting at is that nothing is really known and that brings me to myself those of you that know me know i wouldn't lie like this i wouldn't make this up i'm not an actor i'm just being myself and we're gonna have some some fun together i hope we do because at the end of the day these channels these podcasts that deal with supernatural cryptids and other things in the end of the day, they're for entertainment, and you're here to be entertained. And I don't blame you because I have been entertained by a lot of different channels, and I've been on a lot of different channels. The most recent is What Lurks Beneath with Josh Nanocchio, and he interviewed me last Friday, October 20th, 2023, on YouTube. And if you want to see a very detailed interview with me about what happened, every detail that you can imagine, take a look at his channel and you'll see that. Josh did an amazing job. He's an amazing person and a good friend of mine. And we got close uh, at the Paranormal Roundtable Dogman Encrypted Conference in Texas in September. And I'm glad I met him. And we've had a lot to talk about. And you're going to see Josh and I have collaborations with each other, along with other people. I've been on other podcasts, Paranormal Roundtable, Cryptonormal Encounters with Patina Moss, The Confessionals, Dixie Cryptid, Sasquatch Theory, Sasquatch Chronicles, and many, many more. And I will make sure that I put that list out there so that you guys can see the other interviews and that my story has not changed over the years. It's the same because it's true. And those of you who are going to doubt it and maybe say that they don't believe me. And again, I don't begrudge you because I feel bad for you actually that you don't have the ability to realize that there are things out there that are real that we're told aren't. There's a veil out there right in front of us and I'm talking to you, not you, you. Yeah, you, right there. There's a veil in front of you right now, don't you know that? It's invisible. There are beings walking by you right now that might not notice you, they might. We may be their ghosts. We may be their cryptids. 
maybe why we see shadow people some people do and they say they stare at us from afar and they're looking and they might be looking at us from where they're from as what is that what who is that how strange what is it and it's you sometimes these cryptids and aliens and beings from other realms bleed into our universe or our world Planet 412 is going to delve into that, into these different experiences and beings that are out there. And I hope you enjoy this, this journey that we take together. And I'm excited to be here with you. I'll tell you more about the things that have happened to me and trust me, there's more. I just barely touched on them tonight. I'm glad that you gave me the ability to share this time with you and I look forward to other times. So we're going to take off from Planet 412 right now, but I hope that you come back. My name's Matt Amsch and I'm the one who's going to be helping you make your way through this awesomely strange world that we live in. Thank you. Have a good night.